In this Warmaster video I shall revisit the tier list which I made two years ago. I will be ranking all the Warmaster armies in order of effectiveness based upon my personal opinion. Over the last two years the Warmaster army lists have undergone significant development, with certain armies having entirely new units added to them, whilst others have had the profile or the points value of existing units changed. The Warmaster Revolution Rules Compendium has also undergone significant changes, and this has had an impact upon the special rules used by certain units. Two entirely new armies have also been added for competitive play, Nippon and Cathay. All of these factors mean that the original tier list I made in 2021 is now somewhat out of date. So now that I've had sufficient time to play with and against the armies that have had significant changes, as well as playing with and against the two new armies, it's time for a new Warmaster Armies tier list. A tier list is a simple visual representation, allowing you to rank items in order with the worst at the bottom and the best at the top. This year I've gone for five categories. They are ranked from D at the bottom up to S or superlative at the top. The order in which I'm ranking the armies this year is based on a number of factors, number one being my own experiences for and against that army. Number two is my observations of other players using their armies in tournament play and in friendlies. And number three is how easy a particular army is to use for a new player. As always, my opinion is entirely subjective, so please feel free to agree or disagree with any of my tier rankings in the comments below. So the first thing we're going to put right at the bottom of the tier list is the dice. If your dice are giving you high scores for command and low scores for everything else, sometimes you just have to accept that this is going to be one of those games, congratulate your opponent on his good fortune, and suffer your defeat like a gentleman. We all have games like this from time to time, and no matter what army you have picked, if the dice are against you, you can't expect to win. So the first army which I'm ranking right at the bottom of the tier list are the Witch Hunters. The Witch Hunters can field a low quality infantry horde army. They do have access to excellent artillery and a good spell list, but their cavalry is extremely limited. You will also lose control of some of your infantry units when fighting against chaos or undead. And apart from some spell clarifications and a minor buff to their wizard character, the Witch Hunters have not received any significant updates in the last two years. This combination of factors means that the Witch Hunters requires a very skilled player to achieve victory. So if you are an experienced general looking for a challenge, why not give the Witch Hunters a try and offer up some suggestions on how they could be improved. Just above the Witch Hunters I've put the Goblins. Goblins are also a low quality infantry horde army, but they do have access to a lot of mobile elements with chariots and wolf riders. The Goblins have received some positive changes in the last two years, with Giants now being cheaper and Trolls being much more effective. However, these bonuses don't really overcome the critical weakness of the Goblin list, which is its command structure. Goblin characters have the lowest command values in the game, so most of the time the Gobbos are just going to sit around waiting for the enemy to act, so this will limit your playstyle to a more defensive one. However, Goblins can be a very fun army to play with. Just be aware it's going to take a long time to collect and paint a Goblin army, let alone learning how to win with one. The final army I'm going to leave in D tier are the Beastmen. Beastmen have had a significant number of changes in the last two years. Minotaurs were brought more in line with other Fnatic style units whilst Centigors were changed to cavalry and got a price decrease. The Chaos Spawn got some decent buffs to its special rules whilst the Shagoth got a points decrease. Meanwhile all Beastmen infantry can now ignore the penalty for dense terrain whilst in woods. Despite these positive changes, the Beastman General may struggle to use his army effectively, as the ambush rule is not really effective threat projection. Without their own artillery or any flyers, the Beastmen will struggle against enemy artillery and heavy cavalry, so not the best choice for the newer player. 
Now we're going to move up to C tier and have a look at some armies which are a bit easier to use. First up in C tier I've placed one of the new armies, Cathay. Cathay can field an impressive variety of missile armed troops including powerful artillery, but its close combat potential is restricted. And while you can build an army themed around black powder with the most number of armour piercing shooting attacks in the entire game, it is very hard to concentrate this firepower in what is essentially an infantry horde. Still, an experienced general can do well with Cathay, and as more players experiment with the army, new strategies and tactics are bound to be developed. Next in C tier I've put the Skaven, another infantry horde army. The Skaven have had some significant updates in the last two years. Skaven now have access to more effective ambushes and effective artillery, which allows the Skaven general to experiment with different tactics other than march forward in a big blob. However, with no access to cavalry or flyers, Skaven will suffer against artillery heavy enemies. Enemy shooting attacks which cause drivebacks and confusion is often the bane of the Skaven infantry horde. And to build a viable army, you need to be prepared to paint a lot of rats. Next up in C tier I've put the Ogres. The Ogre army list has had one of the greatest number of changes in the last two years. Lead Belchers, Yetis, Gorgers, Rhinox Riders and the Slave Giant have all had additional special rules or a price reduction. And they've also got a new Chaff Cavalry unit, Sabre Tusks. Ogres now have access to the tools they needed to counter enemy cavalry, enemy artillery and enemy flyers. In my opinion the Ogre Army has benefited the most from recent changes which is why it has jumped 5 places up my tier list. Next in C tier I've placed Kislev. Kislev are a cavalry and shooting themed army with some unique supporting elements. Both the Bears and the War Wagons have recently received a points reduction which will help to mitigate some of the perceived weaknesses in the army. A recurring issue with the Kislev list is that the winged lancers just cannot compete with true heavy cavalry, which can cause generals to avoid picking such an iconic unit. However, the great mobility of the Kislev army earns it a higher place on my tier list than the infantry horde armies. Next up in C tier I've put the demons. Demons still have access to some very powerful troop types and their most expensive units, the demon beasts and the greater demon, have received a price reduction. Their magic is also strong with the ability to heal wounded units. The intrinsic weakness of the army however remains instability, so you can never be entirely certain how your units are going to behave once they've taken attrition. However demons are an easy army to collect, paint and play, as their primary tactic is simply rush forward and kill the enemy. Next in C tier and above the demons I've placed the Chaos Dwarfs. The Chaos Dwarf list has benefited from price reductions on their cavalry and hobgoblin units, a massive power boost to their artillery, more effective blunderbusses and minor tweaks to the spell list and the character mounts. This means you can try out new options in your lists and the units you do pick are likely to be more effective. And whilst they do have a few new tricks up their sleeve, in my experience the Chaos Dwarf list is not unbeatable and they still struggle to deal with enemy cavalry and flyers. The last army I'm going to put in C tier are the Norse. The Mammoth, Storm Giant and Valkyries have all received price reductions, with Valkyries in particular becoming a much more viable unit and not restricted to one per army, with the Horn of Resounding now becoming a useful character upgrade. These changes allow you to squeeze in some mobile units to chase down enemy cavalry and make the Norse army a lot more fun to play in my opinion. As the Norse no longer have to rely on big blocks of Huskarl infantry in order to win, their place on my tier list has gone up. We now move up to B tier where we will find armies which are in my opinion both fun to play and competitive. The first army I'm going to put in B tier is Nippon. In the same way as Demons the Samurai list has access to some very powerful troop types. However the Samurai units don't suffer from instability and the army as a whole calculates its breakpoint as being one higher than normal. On paper the army looks very good indeed, but it's not invincible. Enemy artillery and enemy heavy cavalry will cause Nippon problems. And as one of the new kids on the block the Nippon list has yet to make an impression at the tournament scene. 
Next up in B tier I've placed the Dogs of War. With cheaper Giants, cheaper Light Cavalry and cheaper Pikemen, the Dogs of War have benefited from some price reductions this year. Although in my opinion the Pikemen are still the weak link in the army, at least you're not wasting too many points on them. And the Dogs of War have many other viable units around which you can build your army. Dogs of War remain a very popular army and are both fun to play with and play against. Just above the Dogs of War I've placed the Dwarfs. Dwarfs have a limited playstyle based around their artillery and their infantry. But both their heavy infantry and their artillery are excellent. Dwarfs can compete very well at tournaments. And with the new rules for ambushing rangers they finally have some tactical flexibility when it comes to projecting force. The weakness of the Dwarf Army is its lack of mobility and its reliance on terrain for victory. Dwarfs are a good choice if you're learning to play the game as their playstyle is quite straightforward and with their Command 10 General it's easier to correct any mistakes made in deployment. Just above the Dwarfs in the middle of B tier I've placed Chaos. Chaos has received some positive changes this year with Dragon Ogres becoming cheaper and the Spawn and the Trolls becoming more effective. At smaller points games Chaos remains very powerful as Chaos Warriors and Chaos Knights are the best troops in the game. However at 2000 points and above a Chaos General may struggle against a wily opponent as the enemy is far more likely to outnumber you and will have access to effective artillery brigades which can rout your troops. However Chaos remain a great army to collect and paint, they're a lot of fun to play and easy for a beginner to pick up the rules. So for me they remain solid B tier. Next up in B tier I've placed the Tomb Kings. Tomb Kings have a great selection of unit types and can compete in all phases of the game. This year both the Sphinx and Bone Giant have received a price reduction and as their monsters have no brigading restrictions if you've always wanted to try out a monster mash build now is the time. Still the Tomb Kings lack of initiative, poor command range and reliance on magic to win the game makes them B tier at best. However if you enjoy painting skeletons then Tomb Kings remain one of the most rewarding armies to collect and paint. Next in B tier I've placed the Empire. The Empire have not received any significant changes in the last two years but this is not a bad thing as they remain a solid army choice. The Empire remain a competitive army with excellent artillery and unlimited knights. You just have to keep the enemy from getting into your weak infantry. The Empire are often seen as the army against which all other armies are compared, but don't underestimate them. In the hands of a skilled general, the Empire can be a force to be reckoned with, and are a great choice for a new player wanting to learn the rules. Landing just above the Empire this year are the Orcs. The Orcs have benefited from cheaper giants and better rules for trolls, meaning you can experiment with the entire army list. Their great drawback is their Command 8 General but provided you take plenty of heroes to order your brigades, you can easily get off one or two orders a turn and surprise the enemy with sneaky flank charges. One great appeal of the Orc army is that you can take loads of them and they hit really hard even when the fight goes against them. And the army which I'm going to place at the top of B tier are the Wood Elves. Yes I have revised my opinion of the Wood Elves. They have great mobility with their Command 10 General and have access to some very powerful melee units with the Tree Spirits. With the changes to the Tree Singing rule you can now play a viable aggressive infantry build and in my opinion any rule which encourages the Tree Huggers to leave their woods is a good thing. The Wood Elves are powerful but not unbeatable and they remain a very popular choice with newer players who enjoy the aesthetic. We're now moving up to A tier which in my opinion contains the more competitive armies and you'll often see these armies placing well at tournaments. The first army I've placed in A tier are the Vampire Counts. The Vampire Counts have a solid command structure, very powerful magic and multiple sources of terror. Their cheap infantry means they are likely to outnumber you and the standard Vampire Counts tactic is to absorb the enemy charges Surround them, counter charge and raise dead to destroy the enemy. In the right hands a Vampire Count's army is very powerful indeed and it can be quite a struggle to kill off enough of their troops before they raise even more. The Vampire Count's army list has not received any updates for two years 
as it was felt to be powerful enough. The next army in A tier is Albion, who have received a price reduction for their giants this year. Albion have a wonderful toolbox at their selection, including powerful infantry, chariots and flyers, whilst their spell list will get the enemy reaching for a dispel scroll. Albion armies are quite popular at UK tournaments, and many a battle has been won by the surprise placement of a Fenbeast in the enemy's rear. Next up in A tier I'm placing the Bretonians. No changes have been made to the Bretonian army in the last two years. Why meddle with perfection? The Bretonian army is extremely competitive, with unlimited knights that are immune to terror, and entirely disposable peasants to absorb the enemy charges. Bretonia can compete well in all phases of the game, and has access to some fantastic spells. Bretonia remains a very popular choice for those that favour an aggressive playstyle, or for those that enjoy painting 10mm heraldry. Next up, just above Bretonia, I've placed the Lizardmen. Lizardmen have benefited from a reduction in points cost for the Stegodon, and a slight buff to Salamanders. They remain a very powerful army, with some of the most cost effective infantry in the game. They also boast fantastic heavy cavalry, excellent flyers, and an amazing spell list. Only their restrictive command range limits their power. A very popular army, and one to be underestimated at your peril. At the top of A tier, I'm placing my old favourite, Araby. The Araby army list is just so much fun to play. Whilst the infantry is decidedly mediocre, the cavalry choices are amazing, and you also have access to flying carpets and elephants. Characters get the choice of two terror causing mounts, while spellcasters are spoilt for choice, with a host of utility spells. With access to some of the best looking Warmaster models, Araby is a firm fan favourite. And now it's time to move up to the top and look at the armies which have earned S tier status. Starting off S tier, we have the Dark Elves. An army that's easy to play with and still very competitive at tournaments. Dark Elves are a great choice for both the veteran gamer and the total beginner. The Hydra has received a points reduction this year, which means you might have room for one in your list alongside the Cold Run Knights. With a Command 10 General and Heavy Cavalry, this army is straight into S tier for me. The Dark Elf Command rule, which forces you to sacrifice heroes when they blunder, is the only reason why Dark Elves don't occupy the top spot on this list. Which inevitably brings us to the conclusion that the best army in Warmaster are the High Elves. Warmaster is a strategy game about control and command and High Elves excel at commanding their troops and moving them to where they are needed at the right time. You have a Command 10 General, unlimited heavy cavalry and excellent flyers. Your artillery and missile attacks are also powerful and you can field terror causing dragons, which have recently had a points discount. High Elves are easy to play with and easy to paint, which makes them an ideal choice for the new Warmaster player. Their command structure is very forgiving and you're highly likely to get off charges when you need them, which makes playing as High Elves a very positive experience for a newer player. Meanwhile, veteran gamers can still enjoy playing as High Elves if you restrict yourself to the less competitive aspects of the list. Overall an excellent army and well deserving of the top spot. But we're not done yet with this tier list. There is a factor which is far more important than your choice of army. And that is player skill. This is the reason why High Elves aren't winning every tournament. All Warmaster armies are viable, and a good player can take a D tier army and beat an S tier army. Warmaster is a game which rewards player experience, and this is perhaps one reason why it's so popular amongst veteran gamers. By playing battles and building up your own experience, you can directly contribute to the future of this amazing game by providing your feedback to the Rules Committee. So thank you for listening to my thoughts on the relative rankings of Warmaster Armies. How does your experience differ from mine? And what changes would you make to the rankings on this tier list? If you agree with me that certain armies appear slightly underpowered at the moment, what positive changes would you make? 
please let me know in the comments below and you can also share your ideas with the community in general on the experimental rules forum.